This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. Hi, everybody. As an exciting announcement this week, I wanted to let you know that I am reopening one-on-one coaching slots with me as of this week. You can check out the details of working with me at carolinedonahue.com slash coaching. I have a limited number of slots at the moment. I'm going to cap it at four people. One is already taken. So if you are interested, you'll want to go there as soon as you can. Again, it's carolinedonahue.com slash coaching to learn about signing up for a consult and working on me one-on-one to get your book down on paper. I hope to speak to you soon. This is episode 87. My guest this week is Paula Priamos, who is the author of The Shyster's Daughter, a memoir, and the psychological thriller Inside V. Her writing has appeared in Crime Wave magazine in the UK, the New York Times magazine, the Washington Post magazine, and Ziziva, among others. She teaches creative writing in English at Cal State University San Bernardino, and she lives in California. I was really excited to have Paula Priamos on today because I always have the same question when I'm reading thrillers, which is, when does the author know what's going to happen at the end? Do they find out as they're writing or do they plot it out from the beginning? And I'm sure every author is different, but this was a topic I really wanted to talk about with Paula as well as how she explores this process and her insights coming from her experience as a professor, as well as a writer herself. So I know you'll really enjoy this episode. So here we go with Paula Primos. Hey, Paula, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks so much for inviting me, Carolyn. Yeah. So I am really, there's something I've wanted to talk about ever since reading Inside V, which is your second novel, which came out this year. Um, I want to know, and of course you can't speak for all suspense or or thriller writers. But did you know what the ending was when you started writing the book? Or did you figure it out in the process? Because this is something that mystifies me about writing suspense. I'm like, when does the author know what's going to happen? I didn't know the ending until I got about, I want to say about four or five chapters to the end. And I was teasing, or I was telling one of my friends rather. I'm rooting for one character in particular, but I really hope he or she, you know, is a good person. And she said to me, Paula, you're the one writing the book. Why (laughs) why do you not know? And I said, I just have to stay true to the characters and my vision. And I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't know what they're going to do yet. And so my characters constantly surprised me as the story unfolded. And with my new book, it's doing the same thing. So I think that's that's at least how I write. Um, I don't know if other writers um, begin with a preconceived ending, but sometimes you can you can have um, a book that has some false parts in it if you're too committed to an ending you envision early on. That's what I would think because. In thinking about it, I think if I knew, and I do like a basic outline when I'm writing, but there's always things that show up that I wasn't expecting. And Mm -hmm. I think that whenever there's a mystery, I always think, my God, that was so complicated. They must have known something about how this happened or did it all just come together? And I'm so fascinated by this process. So I'd love to hear about your process in, in writing Inside V and and how did you first come up with the idea? And then how did it evolve as your writing process continued? Well, I first started with the characters. And I first started with Grant and his wife, Ava. And it was his second marriage. And it started with adultery. He had had an affair with Ava early on with his marriage to his first wife. And my thought was, what if this couple who's madly in love Um, what if there's an element of distrust because of how they got together? And so I kind of played with that idea, but then I also played with the idea of what what does a couple do if they're so passionate for each other and that passion never wanes? So it never stabilizes 
even with four or five years of solid married life. So I was really mm-hmm. intrigued by that idea. And then I threw in into the mix the idea of Grant being charged with um, sexual assault of an underage, a 17-year-old girl. And that idea came to me. And I thought how hard it would be for a wife. She would want to believe her husband, but then, of course, she's rational. And she part of her would, you know, deeply, deeply question whether he was telling her the truth or not. So yeah. that's how the book started. And and then it just it took off from there. That's it's such an interesting premise also because of Ava being a former she was a former defense lawyer. Right. And so she she knows when people are lying and she knows when they're telling the truth. Um, at the beginning of the book, it starts with the middle of things, of course, where you're always supposed to start um, in the <laughs> middle of, of Grant's trial. And she knows in the back of her mind which way the jurors are leaning just because of all of the time she spent in the courtroom. And um, that idea came to me because my first book, The Shyster's Daughter, it's a memoir. Um, I grew up in courtrooms with my father. I would watch him. He was a defense attorney. And so I know a lot about courtroom drama and that kind of thing, procedures. And so I, I wanted I wanted to write a strong protagonist who gets who finds herself in an impossible situation, but she's so wise about all of it and yet she's still so madly in love and almost blind at some points when it comes to her husband yeah it's an amazing thing because I think all of those elements are played out it's almost like you've pulled out a lot of people's kind of fantasy of having that kind of relationship but also their worst nightmare kind of colliding at the same time which really ups the stakes of the story yeah I I I really that was the intention, I guess, just to imagine what it would be like to be in that kind of relationship that is so unpredictable, so passionate, um, oftentimes dangerous because you don't know what you're capable of. You don't know what you would do in order to protect that person or stop that person from leaving you. And then, of course, there's, there's other characters that are involved as well. Yeah, that, that kind of indicate... It's interesting, too, that you have people as well that are kind of contrasts. That's like a former, um, I don't know if I want to, definitely not a former partner, but a former interest. It's, Mm -hmm. I don't know, connection, associate. It's, I don't know how to describe him. A former date of Ava's in the, in the story, as well as the, the previous wife. Um, I almost think of Ava as 1.5, given the... (laughs) given the, how short the first marriage was. Um, right. But you get to see both of these other people that Grant and Ava were involved with. And I thought that was a really interesting choice to show who these people were that they had beach, been involved with before being involved with each other and seeing the contrast between those experiences. Yeah, and I, I think that we we sometimes think we have a pattern of you know, our romantic relationships, we pick the same people, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. And I think that there are times where, you know, people, and I, and I know people who, you know, who've stayed with, stayed with a partner longer than they should have, um, or they feel like their relationship is um, not as strong as it could be. And then there are people who, who recognize they want to get out of a relationship that they feel could be better and they want to try to find someone new. Um, So I, so I kind of played with that idea too, about that, what, what would be the type of X that, that these two characters would have. And I also, I, I hate books and, and women are kind of guilty of this, in my opinion, I guess this sounds kind of sexist, but (laughs) <laughs> women, women writers can be guilty of making an ex-wife or an ex-girlfriend be not as bright or there's no deep reason why she feels resentful or the, you know, these kinds of where, she, where the character is more superficial. Um, there's no depth to the character. 
And I didn't want to do that. I wanted I wanted to show that that um, you know Grant had hurt this ex wife by leaving her so soon after they'd gotten married, and um, she was embittered, but she had every right to be embittered. And she's I don't think I made her um, unlikable. I think that I that she's strong in her own way. So I didn't want to make any characters that were weak or um, one dimensional. Yeah. It's like you, I think sometimes I know what you're talking about where there's a situation where there's the main characters and then there's other characters. And it almost feels like movies where the music is really overpowering and you know from it how you're supposed to feel about these people or in this situation. Yeah. And you don't get to make up your own mind. Right. And there was just one small line in the book I made about the ex-wife, um, how she came from money. She came from Newport Beach money, but that her parents made her work. They they made her realize that um, she had to earn the silver spoon that she was given. And I just kind of wanted to put a few little, you know, lines like that about her upbringing that, you know, maybe... Maybe the wealthy aren't all bad people. Maybe people who come from the wrong part of town aren't all bad people. Um, maybe some are, some aren't. Um, I just wanted to kind of show the complexity um, of all people, especially in Southern California. Yeah, that was really fun too, actually, to read a book set in Los Angeles. And also, by total coincidence, we went to Palm Springs over New Year's. <laughs> So given that there's a significant portion of the book that happens in Palm Springs, it was very funny. I read this before going out there and I thought, oh dear, how is this this trip? Is my husband and I going to, to Palm Springs? So when you all read the book, you'll see that there's some significant stuff that, that happens in Palm Springs. And um, I, I was just like, oh dear, the desert, how dramatic. Um, so it was very funny to read that in advance. It's interesting how a setting can really um, amp it up because being there and and being in that place where everything is so like the streets are so straight and you can see almost to the next town out there, they're so straight and how that you can feel kind of compressed. So seeing that landscape after reading that story, I could see where that setting was really great for like tension happening in a relationship. Yeah. And, and I, that's one of my, Palm Springs is probably one of my favorite places. And so my, you know, my friends weren't surprised that I, that I uh, placed part of the book there. But um, I find it interesting down there because there's so many different walks of life that are in Palm Springs. Um, There are the elderly who go there to retire. There are immigrants coming from Mexico and other countries that go, that go there to get jobs. Um, there's, there's, it's a transient town, you know, where people, people stay for a while, they work at a hotel or an Indian casino, and then they leave. Um, so I, I was really fascinated. It's kind of like a miniature Vegas down there in my mind. Mm-hmm. A little bit. And so I thought, what a great place. And then I came across a hotel in particular that, that kind of was the basis for the hotel that Grant and Ava stay at. And um, it's kind of one of those places where it's sexy, a little sleazy, very trendy, and where if something bad were to happen, they might not even know it because nobody's exactly paying attention to you because right. there are so many people there. That's wild. Do you just keep like settings like this kind of in the back of your mind as you're kind of cooking on stories. I just, I'm always interested in how people collect settings or were you just like, no matter what happens when I write this book, I got to get Palm Springs in there because I love it. No, I, I actually first thought I was going to set it in Los Angeles in studio city because I saw in my mind that they had this kind of starter home in Mm -hmm. studio city. So that was in my head. And then when he decides to to give them a little reprieve from the trial to try to get repair their marriage, have the time to repair their marriage, um, I thought, what better place than Palm Springs? Because it's not too far from L.A., but it's far enough away from their everyday life to try um, to forge that relationship they had before the trial. 
Um, so, so really, it, it actually just started with the characters. Then I went to setting, and then and then the rest of it kind of fell into place. How was it since your first book was a memoir? So you went through the process of writing memoir initially. Um, that it sounds like was connected to your kind of upbringing and being in the courtroom. But here you actually got to build your own courtroom. So did it feel like there was a little bit of this novel sort of maybe incubating while you were writing the memoir or did it come as a surprise later? That's an interesting question because when I was writing the memoir, everybody had said to me, oh, you're going to write another memoir after this. And I said, no. I said, I think I'm done because (laughs) this was... The Shyster's Daughter was kind of, I wanted to immortalize my relationship with my dad and how close my dad and I were. And um, once I finished that, I was in it and I kind of structure, I structured the memoir with a, a mystery element to it. So you don't know how or how my father died until the end of the book. Um, so I kind of was already writing with a mystery element with the memoir. So it naturally made sense to, to write a mystery with the next book. Absolutely. And how was it to trans transition? Because I know it's almost like when people talk about memoir, it's overwhelming because there's so much that's happened in life that you have to winnow it down and pick what you're going to include versus the blank page can be kind of intimidating with a with a fictional thing because you're making, you know, everything is being created. Right. So so how was it to transition from one to the other? Well, with the memoir, I did have to pare my life down, as you said. And um, I had to kind of compress time a few uh, in a few places. I had to leave a friend out. Um, there just wasn't room. And um, so there were things like that that I had to consider. Um, it was very painful to write. There were certain parts that were really, really painful to write. I'm not sorry I wrote them. I won't ever read them when I when I do readings. I don't read certain parts of the book because because of that reason. But in terms of going from the memoir to the novel, it took about the same amount of time for me. It took 10 months for the memoir and pretty much 10 months of writing time with this novel. And the way I write is that I write old school. I have spiral notebooks and Mm. I buy tons of college ruled spiral notebooks, all these colorful ones. And I start that way. So I'm not afraid of the blank page. So I'm free writing each scene and I write scene by scene. I always write scene by scene. And um, that's my that's my way of writing. And then I take what I've written down on in my notebook, and then I take that to the computer, and then I revise that. I print it out. I take a look at it, and that's 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 my process, and it works for me. I, I have a hard time just going to the computer, looking at the blank page and the flashing cursor, or the blank screen rather, and the flashing cursor. I just don't I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anyone who loves it, but it is, yeah, I think sometimes it does feel less intimidating to write by hand and you can get it down there, especially if you have a type of notebook you really like. Yeah. Well, I remember asking, I was up and coming and there was this well-known writer and I had asked her, I was at a writer's conference and I had asked her, oh, how do you write? You know, the, the question nobody wants to answer, no writer wants to answer. And I said, you know, how do you write? And she said, well, I always write at the computer screen. And she looked at me like I was nuts. And I thought, oh. okay, all right. Um, but, you know, not everybody feels comfortable writing right at the computer screen. And um, I wrote my entire memoir first by hand. Um, and then I took it to the to the computer and it worked. It works for me. I think there's more intimacy, more connection. And um, um, yeah, just more, just more connection to my thoughts when I write them down. Less of, less stress when you're writing by hand, because you can just toss the page out versus having to delete things, cut this, cut that, add this, add that on the screen. 
I mean, I go through an, a whole other process once I um, am inputting it on, you know, in the computer, but um, it just seems to work for me that way. So how do you start with character? So by the time you're sitting down with your notebooks, it sounds like you've got a sense of, of where to start and you're going scene by scene. But what, how do you get from the point when you first had the idea that we talked about earlier to the point where you knew what the first scene was going to be and you were still developing who these people were? Well, it's kind of a process of, it sounds a little bit nutty, but I, <laughs> I, see, I see them in my head and their lives start to play out in my head. Once I get a good handle on the characters I'm going to be writing about. So they're all kind of rattling in there, wanting me to write their story for them. And I'll sit down and I'll start to write a scene. And it may be a scene that I decide not to use. Just like, um, what was it? A couple couple days ago, I, I had handwritten something for the new book I'm working on. And I looked at it and I thought, I don't know why I started here. And when I took it to the computer, I started someplace else. Now I incorporated incorporated a lot of what I'd written in my notebook, but I started in a, I started a little bit sooner than I had anticipated. At you know when I once I sat down at the computer and looked at what I'd written down. So it just kind of varies. But I think the freedom of writing with a notebook allows you to kind of play around. So say I'll start a scene on the first page of my notebook. And then I'll think to myself, oh, you've got to add this part about her life or her past. And so I'll go a little bit ahead in my notebook and I'll write down a whole page of something that I want to write about later, about a memory of hers or something important that happened in her life. Um, so I So I can go back and forth with my notebooks when I'm at the computer and I can remember good stuff that I might have lost if I had just been sitting at the computer, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Because, yeah, I think it's there's this thought that you can just sit down at the screen and type away and it'll unfurl in one right. long kind of strip. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, no. I think, I mean, we all dream of it, but I don't. I have never heard of that happening. No, the only time that happens for me, and this is when it, when I'm lucky very lucky. I'll write an entire chapter in one day. It's happened a couple times where I've just written an entire chapter. I've just sat down and done it. Um, Like the chapter. Which chapter is it? uh, Was the chapter when Ava goes to the wedding reception. Um, I wrote that one in one day. I had the house to myself. I wrote the entire thing. And what's great about those moments is you look at it later and it's clean and it's somehow ready to go. You don't know how you did it, but you're just damn happy it worked out. You know, it doesn't always work out that way. Some chapters you go back to more, more than once. Yeah. I think it's, it's those moments that keep you going back in the first place. Right. Right. It, it, and I, I love the process of writing. I'm kind of a geek that way. I love to, fine tune my sentences. I love to go back, add certain things, add some introspection, um, all kinds of stuff like that. I really enjoy revising. And when I teach my students, I tell them because they just want to bang out that draft and be done with it. And I said, no, there's all these things you can add to enhance your work. If you just are a little patient, you give it a little bit of time, you can make your work so much stronger. Yes. And I think the part of of writing, so you're writing with your notebooks and do you go all the way through from start to finish in the notebook before you go to the computer? Oh, no. Or do you do it in stages? I do it in stages. So each chapter, I'll write the chapter um, in my notebook. Then I go and I'll write maybe half the chapter or I'll type the half the chapter, maybe all of the chapter just depends on on um, the progress, how I'm, how, how I'm progressing with the chapter um, on the computer, but I, I do it in stages. But again, I, I, you know, your mind as a writer, your mind will jump ahead. My mind will jump ahead and I'll come up with a great line that I'm not going to be using for another hundred pages. And so I'll write it down somewhere 
in one of my notebooks and remind myself on the top, you want to use this later. So I'll, I can go back to it. That's smart. Yeah, because it does. If you're, when you're working on the book, I don't know if you have this experience. I do. It's like if you're sitting around with your characters and then you go for a walk or you, you know, you're doing something, or even if you're doing laundry or whatever, they're still hanging out there oh, and they're right. still doing things. Oh yeah. They can drive you crazy. The your characters <laughs> can drive you crazy. I, I um, didn't write for a couple months because I was teaching um, at Cal State, San Bernardino, and I just didn't have the time. And the characters were driving me crazy. And so when when I got my Christmas break, I sat down. I thought, I have to write because if I don't get this down, I'm going to go nuts. And so I started writing again. And, you know, I realized that even if you don't have a lot of time in your week, you still have to make some time to write. It just, it makes me feel better. It um, makes me feel, I identify myself first as a writer over being a professor. And um, it just makes me more sound, makes me more stable when I'm writing, if that makes sense. It does. But say more, say more like how does, what do you, what do you think is happening there? What, what do you mean by? Like it makes me more sound. Like what is that? What does that feel like? Well, it 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 just makes me feel like like okay. For instance, when I I finished a chapter right before I went on my trip, I I took a couple of days to go to Vegas, and I finished the chapter. It looked good. It was pretty well polished. It was one of those. I had one of those lucky chapters where I finished it fairly fast. And I just thought, oh, God, this feels so good to be a writer again. And to say I'm more than halfway through with a book now, with a new book. And to know in my mind that I know where I want to take this book and I'm still excited to take this book to the end. And um, it just, it anchors you. It anchors you. Um, it gives you kind of a compass that you're a writer first and And yes, you have a day job. Yes, I am a teacher. But I have to remind myself and I have to put into practice my writing skills because if I don't, um, something's missing from my life and I feel it. And I don't, I don't feel right. If I just, I don't feel right. I'll feel like um, I'm not doing, I just feel kind of on edge. I guess that's the word. I feel on edge if I'm not writing. Yeah, I think that's true. It's, There's something about, I think there's like a very short list of activities I can think of. And when you do them, you never question whether it was a good idea to do them afterwards. Right. Like, you know, like, I don't know, exercise usually feels that way. And and writing is definitely one of them. It's never like, "Mm, did I, should I have spent that afternoon writing? (laughs) That's never even a question. Yeah. Mentally, mentally, it, um, it quiets me. It settles me mentally. Mm -hmm. If I, if I'm writing and I'm in the middle of something new that I'm working on. Um, when I finished inside V, I said, woohoo, I'm going to take some time off and I'm going to enjoy the book coming out. And I did, I did, but then, but then it starts creeping back and you start, you start, um, thinking of other characters and you start thinking of other possibilities of where you could take the characters. And then, Shortly, oh, a couple of months into promoting the book, I went, oh, no, it's starting again. I have to start <laughs> writing again. And I had already started the book, the one I'm working on, but I hadn't really, I hadn't really um, gotten into the throes of it yet. And, and um, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling when you're, when you're really excited about something new. And I know it's hard when you're writing, because I've been there, um, to stay excited about a project because who's waiting for it? And um, maybe there is somebody waiting for it. Maybe you have a publisher who's waiting for it. But with writing, you have to um, you have to get yourself excited about writing. You have to motivate yourself. And it can be very hard because, like for me, I live in a gorgeous place in Lake Arrowhead. And I'll think, well, I could take my dogs for a walk, which I do. Or I could go for a run, which I do. I could do all these other things. 
But then I also give myself a few hours in the morning to write because again, it settles my mind and it makes me, it uh, stabilizes me. And it makes me feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Yeah. I think that's really what it is. It does. It feels, even if it's crappy writing, uh-huh. even if it's like, it's not going that well, Jay, it still feels like this is a, a worthy way to spend my time. Right. And there's, there are days when, you know, you have your, your stumbles, you, you start and you stumble and you, and you say, man, this stuff is awful. This is just awful, lame, stilted dialogue, but I'll, I'll keep going. I'll just keep going. And then the next morning you look at it and maybe you'll say, you know what, some of this is, you know, I can keep, it's not bad. Other times you'll say, no, it has to go, but then it sparks something else. And it almost inevitably sparks something else. Another way to approach your scene or whatever you're working on. So I think even bad writing can somehow turn into good writing, as long as you're always writing and thinking about the book that you're working on or the short story. Definitely. I think it's true. And I think also, I used to have this weird fear of revision. Like I thought, oh, what's going to happen? Or I don't know. Like the fun part is when you're figuring out the story in the beginning, but the revision is really like mucking around. But I don't think that's true anymore. I think it's it's like that's when you have something to actually work with. Right. I love, like I said, to fine tune it and refine it um, and think, ooh, this is a better line than what I'd given her, this character, that character. Um, and and that's all good. And and again, I like to I like to write cleanly. I I, I read so many mystery books where I just think, you know, you the writer was thinking about the story or the plot, but really not about the words and the sentence. Mm. And so there's a difference between a literary mystery writer or thriller writer and then just your typical thriller writer, I think. And so I'm more of a literary person. You know, I have an MFA. I grew up, I fell in love with Hemingway's writing at uh, 15 years old. And um, so I, I love I love reading good writers. Um, so I love language. So whenever I read someone's book, I, I automatically will appreciate a good line versus a line that I think, oh, you just you just wrote this because you were you were thinking more along the lines of the plot, but you weren't really taking the care you could be with your prose. I think that's a really important thing because sometimes this relationship to language seems to get parceled out in people's minds according to the genre they're writing. Right. Like, like, oh, if you're a literary fiction writer, then you really care about language. But if you're writing other things, then, then people sort of assume that you don't. And I don't find that to be the case. No. And I, I was frustrated because People had said to me, oh, you're going to be a literary writer. And I said, well, wait a second. Why can't I be a literary writer who writes a thriller? And and um, there were people who kind of balked at first and said, well, you know, it, it, even if you try to write this, it may come off like a literary novel. And I don't quite know what that means. I mean, the only thing I do know about literary novels is they tend to not be as plot driven as say a genre book as a thriller or science fiction or something like that. But I always tell my students, you can be a good literary science fiction writer. You can be a good thriller writer. Um, You just have to care about the language. In my mind, as long as you care about the language, you're a literary writer. I agree. And I think that in some ways, the best books are the ones that take the best parts about both sides. I mean, I'm thinking about, I don't know if you read, um, Benjamin Percy wrote this book of essays on writing called Thrill Me. Hmm. No. And his, it, it was really great. And one of the things he said was in the initial book, his sort of premise was that, you know, he used to read a lot of science fiction and thrillers when he was younger, but he thought, you know, the writing's kind of clunky, mm-hmm. but I still like it. 
And then he would read literary novels and be like, wow, the language is really beautiful, but I kind of want some more stuff to happen. Right. And he's like, couldn't we put these two things together? And wouldn't that make the best possible book? Exactly. It, it, this is a funny side story, but as I said, I was 15 when I first fell in love with Hemingway. And um, at the time, my parents had divorced and my father would send me all the way to Tennessee every couple weekends. And to visit my mother and my little brother and my older sister. And so I would read Jackie Collins books just to bide my time on the plane. And <laughs> it was, I was reading her before I encountered a Hemingway book. And so I was reading her about, I guess, 13, 14 years old. Here I am reading Jackie Collins and totally digging her and loving her books. And I come across a farewell to arms. And it was assigned in my class, in my high school class. And it just stopped me. It just stopped me. I couldn't believe how well written it was. I recognized it without anyone telling me, wow, this is good writing. Um, I was bawling by the end of the book. I was remembering, I was remembering certain images that Hemingway wrote. Um, and I just thought, what am I doing wasting my time reading this garbage that I've been reading on, you know, on the plane? And so, so I started reading literary books, but I can see his point that um, in literary works, Hemingway excluded, because he has a lot going on in his stuff pretty much, but a lot of literary writers that, that kind of is the criticism that they do need to have more going on in their, in their books. And um, I think that's a valid criticism. Um, not all literary novels don't have something going on, but usually they're um, they're more um, based on the characters and not necessarily the conflict, in my mind. Yeah, that seems to be the the sort of that they see them as character driven right. rather than right action driven. Right. And but I think you know, in some ways, I mean, that's sort of a chicken and the egg argument. Yeah. You know, it's like, isn't all action created by characters ultimately and aren't all characters created by some action so right. I don't know I always just tell my students you need to have a conflict and you need to resolve your conflict um and and that usually is that's the smartest way to write something um and and if your character decides he's not going to change at the end then he decides not to change or you'd better have him change in some way um, and, and, you know, take, take your reader on some type of journey. Um, so, so that the reader feels like it was worthwhile. I call it the so what factor. So, mm. so I'll put every, every class session when, um, um, I had the workshop, I put all these different literary elements on the board, character, plot, conflict. And then I always, I always call it the so what factor. So I kind of call the student out and, and ask them, what's your so what factor? You know, why did we read this? And, and usually, um, you know, it, it's a good question to ask a writer. Because if, if you don't know the answer to that, then you probably don't have a handle on your story yet. Yeah, that if you know, you know, so what? So I'm writing a book about these two people. So what? Right. And and something, you know, it, do, I, it doesn't need to have to be an epiphany or anything like that at the end of your story. Um, but there just has to be some type of journey, some type of um, connection the reader can make at the end that um, that the story fulfilled them in some way. You know, it made them think about humanity on some level or something. Um, that That's kind of what I mean by the so what factor. It has to it has to have some type of meaning behind it or else why read it or why write it? Exactly. I mean, I think this is something that that has been brought up in, in classes I've been into is that on the one hand, it's kind of tempting to make things like, oh, well, this is what would really happen. But the point of writing a book is to be able to get past what would happen in reality into something that's sort of elevated and means more or something different. Right. If we just wrote like, well, I went and got some milk today and then <laughs> I went down the street and I dropped my shoes off at the shoe repair. Like that's not necessarily worth reading as right, a book. Right. You know, when, when I write, um, some people will, will mistakenly assume, oh, she's writing about a stereotype of a character. 
um, like the 17 year old girl in my book, um, she, I call her the Latina girl. Well, it's my character, Ava, who's narrating the story. She calls her the Latina girl. And my and Ava, my protagonist, she's caught between desperately wanting to believe her husband and the other part of her saying maybe this girl's telling the truth and the fear of the girl telling the truth um, and she, that she's never known her husband. And so some people said, well, how in the world I had one woman at my first reading. She said, how in the world can you um, write about um, something so serious um, about a woman or about a young woman possibly being assaulted? And I said, because that's what happens in life. And and um, you haven't read my book, so you can't make any judgments. I only had read the first chapter. At, in, at the reading, I said, you can't really make a judgment about my book till you've gotten to the ending. And I think that in our society right now, where we read the backs of books, we, we um, don't read an article in a newspaper anymore. We only read, you know, the first paragraph or what someone tells us to read um, or a snippet of something online that could be fake, could be real. Um, we just aren't absorbing anything anymore and we're losing knowledge if that makes sense and that's happening with books and so I kind of admonished the woman and said you know what come back to me after you've read my book and after you've seen what's happened with the with the young girl and all the other characters then tell me whether or not you can accuse me of what you're trying to accuse me of um because I like to, I like to push the boundaries in my writing, and I want to make people question my characters and question um, the storyline, and say, you know, is this person a good person or a bad person? Um, is she stereotyping here, or or is there something deeper going on with this character? Um, you can pretty much guess that it's not going to be a superficial character that I've come up with. Um, but you know, people who haven't read me wouldn't know that. Um, but I just, I feel, I don't know if you do, but I just kind of feel that people aren't comprehending. They're not taking the time to comprehend things anymore. I think that there is, um, there's, I, I don't have the statistic in, in my head or, or right in front of me, but there is some vast multitude of information that we see right now every day and that we're confronted with, you know, I think there's some statistic, like we see more information in front of us in a day than people a hundred years ago saw in, a, you know, in several months or a week or a year, you know, right. Like just in our email boxes where we all have hundreds of emails or thousands, you know, that come through and it's so difficult to digest all of that. And I think people just go on tilt and then they do. It's sometimes they write things off and it's, it's a shame. Well, yeah. I mean, one example was right when the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke and I had heard that Ronan Farrell had written the article about it. So I hunted down the article. Well, the article's very long, very detailed, but I took the time to read the entire article and so many people who were on Twitter, friends of mine on Twitter, uh, Facebook, they were just kind of spouting off. And I thought, you haven't read his article yet, you know, and I don't think you ever will. Um, so we just don't, I just think we're a society where we don't equip ourselves with what we're supposed to before we start to share our opinions. And um, I, it's, it's the effects of, of, technology now, how we live our lives. There's some great rewards to it, but there's also some drawbacks. Yeah. I think that you, you're sort of programmed to have a very quick response right. and whatever response you have first, that's the one you should have. And there's already so much more information coming in. You just move on to the next thing. Right. And, and people, yeah, people just don't take the time to read an entire article or, or read a couple articles on a subject before, you know, yeah, before they render a decision. Um, maybe it's, my father, my father used to, um, one of the things we loved to do was we would debate each other. So he would purposely take the opposing viewpoint 
of me, my opposing viewpoint. And he would question me and he would make me have to support um, my argument very well. And so I just kind of automatically try to get the facts before I start to say, you know, before I decide to comment on something. That's so interesting. And with books, I hate to read, I hate to read um, reviews before I pick up a book or I will just even, you know, if, if it's a book I'm interested in, I will just pick it up and I will buy it. That's it. As I think there's so many, everything's so subjective and so, so many things are politically correct and stringent now um, that I just feel like, you know, I'm going to give this book a chance one way or the other because I was interested in it and I'm not going to let anyone else dissuade me from reading this. Yeah, I think that that's important. I love the idea of people just being able to read and taking the time to read the things that fascinate them just because they're fascinated. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like to, I don't know about you, but I like to go into a bookstore and just open the first couple pages of mm -hmm. and say, you know what, I, I think I want to continue reading on t with this one. I love that. Like exploring first pages of things. It's like going on little trips. Yeah. Yeah. By the exactly. store. Amazing. Well, I can see why with all that in mind, you would you would want to write by hand and, and kind of step away from the overwhelm of technology and then just come back to the computer later. Yeah. You know, my husband, he's a writer. He goes straight to the computer. Like I said, that one woman who looked at me like I was crazy, she went straight to the computer. There's plenty of people where you know, that's, that's where they can write. And I suppose if I was forced to, um, I could do it too. When I write on my blog, I, I sometimes will go to the computer, but still I, again, that's not true. I usually start with a scratch outline of some sort. It's just what I feel comfortable with. And, um, it's, it's freedom. It's a certain kind of freedom to write in the notebook first for me. And there's no judgment, no nothing. I just enjoy it. That's that's probably one of my favorite parts of writing is when I start on the notebook. And then the second favorite part is when I'm revising. All the other stuff mm. is great, you know, when you get your book bought, um, when they're when they're getting it ready, the galleys and all that kind of stuff. That's that's all fun. But I think the most rewarding parts of writing, it, it's really the process. It really is. And I know when I was first starting out and people would tell me that, I would say, oh, shut up. You, you know, you have a published book. <laughs> I don't. So I can see if somebody tells me, thinks that after listening to me. But it's true. When you look back and you think of certain parts of your book that you were writing, you know, you think, wow, that that was probably the best part of this whole book was just coming up with that idea and executing it successfully. Definitely. Well, this has been awesome talking to you, Paula, and I hope everybody will enjoy Inside B and check out The Shyster's Daughter as well. And it's been so great talking with you and hearing more about your writing process. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Secret Library Podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.